everyone. Hello. Hello. OK. Got it. Hello, Thank thanks, you. Thanks for coming our talk. Uh, my name is Mu Huan, and this is my colleague, Zi, both of us are PhD students uh, in, at UCLA. And w at this moment, we are part-time working at the Falcon Computing Solutions. This talk is about deploying accelerators at data center scale um, using Spark. And this presentation, you'll see how, uh, how to get 3x speed up for your Spark applications by using accelerators, and how you can do it with just within three hours. And in this talk, we're going to explain to you what are the challenges we have encountered, how do we solve these problems, and most importantly, we are talking about uh, what we provide so that when you come to this topic, you don't have to go through all these painful processes that we did. Um, today, we're going to uh, talk about accelerators in data centers. The reason that we are looking at this topic is that we have seen that CPU core scaling is coming to an end. And, uh, Using multi cores and increasing number of core cores isn't bring you too much and um, power performance efficiency, and we see data center demand new technologies to sustain scaling. And we have seen accelerators are gaining popularity in this area. GPU is popular, PJ is gaining popularity, and recently Google unveils its TensorFlow uh, computing unit. It's a specialized ASIC to help accelerating machine learning applications, and. In the FPGA area recently, we have seen that Microsoft Bing Searching is adopting FPGAs to accelerate the search engine, and IBM is using FPGAs to accelerate the non-SQL um, query. We have seen news announcement that Altera and IBM are collaborating to accelerate the search. And last year, Intel acquired Altera. Oh, by the way, Altera is an FPGA company. And Intel is predicting that by 2020, 30% of the data center nodes will be equipped with FPGAs. So that's why we are looking into this area. Before we go deep into this topic, please allow uh, me to introduce a little bit about us. Uh, we are working at the UCR Center for Demand Space Computing. Uh, it's founded in 2009 under the Expeditions in Computing Program from NSF. And in 2014, we received funds from public-private partnership between NSF and Intel. Falcon Computing Solutions is a spin-off company from the cent CDSC Center. It is founded in 2014. The vision of the company is to enable customized computing for big data applications. For those of you who are not familiar with FPGAs, FPGA stands for Field Programmable Gate Array. It is a reconfigurable hardware and uh, it has uh, millions of logics on chips so that you can customize it uh, to accelerate uh, specific computations. FPGAs are typically integrated into servers by two ways. One is through PCIe bus. Um, an example is the IBM CAPI platform. Um, the other way is to put FPGAs in the CPU socket. And an example is the uh, Intel hub, hub platform. There are many benefits of FPGAs. First, um, it's very low power. It consumes 20 watts per, per board. And it's energy efficient. It can provide customized highly high performance. With all this aside, uh, we still see problems of deploying accelerators in data center efficiently. Let me explain the challenges we have been through. First, um, programming model is complicated. Not every software understands how to program FPGA or GPUs and it requires too much hardware no specific knowledge to pr um, use these accelerators. You don't need to write a bunch of glue code so that you can offload your computation to accelerators. And in another problem is that these, uh, it lacks a platform possibility. When you switch your accelerators from FPGAs to GPU, you need to rewrite these gluing code. The second challenge is about JVM to accelerator data transfer overhead. Uh, Spark uh, is usually running in the JVM, and accelerator is usually a peripheral devices. Um, and you need to transfer your data from JVM to accelerators. And during this process, we need to do data serialization and deserialization. We need to serialize data so that um, the data object can be serialized into a byte array, and th which can be then transferred to accelerators and the results from the accelerator need to be deserialized so that it can be continued to be used in the Spark program. 
And this uh, additional data transfer um, also may hurt your performance. In the data center, we are thinking there are three groups of people. Big data application developer, who is a software developer and knows all about the Spark. And there are another bunch of people called accelerator developers. They are, very, uh, they are hardware engineers and know all the hardware specific knowledge. And also we have system administrator. Everyone's busy and you don't see them that often. So the communication is actually quite uh, time consuming. When accelerator developer has an accelerator ready, it asks, can, is my accelerator working? Uh, can it fit in your data center? What's the platform in the data center? When software engineers want to use this accelerator, it will ask, how can I offload the computation to your accelerator? What's the I.O. interface? And when he wants to run the application, he asks, which class of nodes has uh, accelerators? And here we are trying to see, is there any way that we can define a unified, unified APIs so that the communication is going to be much easier? Finally, there are more challenges for FPGAs. Uh, the reason is that reconfiguration time is pretty long. Believe it or not, uh, reconfiguration on FPGAs takes about half a second to two seconds. Um, during this process, the uh, executable binary needs to be transferred to the FPGA device, and we need to reset all the bits and walls on FPGAs. And in our experiments, we have seen that naive runtime FPGA sharing may slow down the performance by almost 4x. So what we did, first we are going to provide a better programming model. We provide a set of APIs for accelerator developers. And these, uh, these APIs enables easier integration for accelerators into the big data workload. And you, by using these APIs, we make sure that your accelerators is compatible to the whole ecosystem. Second, we are providing APIs for big data application developers. By using these APIs, you can use, uh, you, you get to know how to do the data transfer between applications and accelerators. And we no longer require any hardware knowledge for the software programmer. The benefit of these two sets of APIs is that we want to decouple the accelerator developer from software developer. Second, we are providing an accelerator management in runtime. Uh, this runtime currently supports both FPGAs and GPUs. We'll get to that in a minute. So we call this system called Blaze. It's a system providing accelerator as a service. Before I talk how our system fits in the whole system, let's first take a look at the yarn today. A typical YON setup including one resource manager and a few node managers, uh, which is, uh, which, which is uh, RM and NM in this graph. And usually each node manager manages the whole resource on a CPU node. And this node manager talks to the resource manager to report the resource and node status. When a client wants to run the application, it first submits a package to the resource manager and then an application master will be launched on this cluster. Application master manages whole computation and all the tasks for this application. Application master will send resource requests to the resource manager and new containers for computation will be launched on the node. In this case, we are seeing two containers launched on one node. And these uh, con containers will be executing the CPU um, software inside. In our place, uh, in our accelerator runtime system, uh, we first add a new set of uh, accelerators. We had a GPU and FPGA platform attached to each node. And we provide two processes. Uh, first, we provide a component called NAM. It is called, uh, it's short for Node Accelerator Manager. This handles local accelerator service management, handles all the data transfer between CPU and accelerators. And then sitting inside the YARN, we also have a global accelerator manager. Um, no, this global accelerator manager oversees all the accelerators in this data center. At this moment, uh, GAM is attached to the Apache YARN, and node manager is a standalone C process. With all this, I'll hand it to D, who will finish the rest of the presentation. Okay, so uh, I'm going to talk more on the details about the programming interface 
and the runtime implementation of Blaze. So first, I will go through the interface, uh, the application interface for Spark. So here I show a uh, simple example of uh, logistic regression training. We have uh, RDD storing the data points loaded from the disk. So these are the training data samples. And then we, uh, in each iteration, we calculate the gradient from these training samples. Because we're going to reuse the data samples, uh, we can indicate the Spark that we want to cache uh, this uh, uh, points RDD. And also, because the main computation of this application is a gradient calculation, we want to put, use the accelerator to accelerate uh, this gradient, calcul uh, gradient calculation to make the whole application faster. So in order to do that, we only need, using the Blaze API, we only need to identify the RDD that needs to be accelerated. So we use a, a wrapper, wrap around the existing RDD, and that wrapper, after the wrapping, the uh, generated RDD will be an acceleratable, acceleratable RDD, or short for ACC RDD. And the next part is that we need to use a customized RDD transform function that can be defined as an extension uh, of a provided base class called accelerators. So in this uh, extended function, we only need to define the ID or the name for the accelerator. So this will be a name of that accelerator service, in this case, a logistic gradient calculation. And under the hood, what this does is that when we call the wrapper, we generate a, uh, a new extended RDD called ACC RDD. And in the ACC RDD, we provided, uh, we extend that compute function to provide a set of uh, operation to serialize the data, send the data to the accelerator node manager. And uh, after, the uh, after the accelerator is finished, we get a result and deserialize and send it back to the Spark task. Similarly, we have a set of API for accelerator developers. So I'm not going to go into details about this, but the idea is very uh, similar, is that we provide the base class for each accelerator, and then the accelerator developer only need to uh, override this compute function, and then so that they don't need to worry about the application details, don't need to worry about how to get the data from the uh, applications, they only need to get the, uh, uh, so, so the accelerator invocation will be handled by the runtime system. And uh, for the deploy, uh, deployment uh, interface, we leverage the existing label management in YARN to uh, manage accelerators as services. So uh, this YARN support for labels are in this uh, 796 uh, discussion thread, so you can have a quick look if you want to know more details. So putting it all together, the de runtime deployment flow looks something like this. So first, when the accelerator developer had developed this acceleratable task or the accelerator in, uh, implementation, we have an interface to register these accelerators uh, on the corresponding data center nodes. And after the no accelerator are registered, the information of the accelerator will be propagated from NAN to the global accelerator manager. So then when the user requests the corresponding accelerator using this ACC ID, the global accelerator manager will allocate the uh, correct nodes in the data center that have the matching accelerators and allocate the containers for the, uh, to the user application and then propagate some container information to each node to the uh, node accelerator manager. And then the user application can start the accelerator invocation and start offloading uh, the computation. So now I'm going to talk a little bit more details on the implementation of the runtime. So the key of uh, providing accelerator as a service is uh, achieved by separating logical accelerators and physical accelerators. So here, logical accelerators indicate the uh, accelerator functionalities. For example, we have logistic gradient calculation, we have k-means calculation, for example. And the physical accelerators correspond to the specific implementation on the physical device. For example, we can have uh, IPD implementation of the logistic gradient calculation, uh, GPU implementation for the same calculation. And the, uh, so then uh, the idea is that the physical and log uh, logical accelerator can be decoupled such that the logical accelerators will be exposed to the application developer and the physical accelerators will be exposed to the accelerator developers. And then in the middle, the runtime system uh, have a bunch of queues, both logical queues and physical queues and a set of schedulers to operate this whole task scheduling so that both ends 
the developer does not need to have specific uh, information uh, for one another. So next part, I'm going to briefly talk about how the techniques we used to optimize a JVM to accelerate our data transfer. So first is the traditional double buffering. So we pipeline the task, uh, we pipeline the deserialization transfer with accelerator execution. And uh, in addition to that, we also provide accelerator sharing. So multiple applications, multiple jobs can use the same accelerator. So then their computation can be overlapped with each other to boost the accelerator utilization. The second part is data caching. So we leverage the in-memory caching provided by Spark so that uh, uh, we can further cache the uh, reusable RDD in the accelerator device memory. And finally, uh, we also provide a broadcast uh, similar to the Spark broadcast. The basic idea is if multiple tasks share the same data, the data only need to be uh, transferred to the accelerator once and the, uh, the tasks are able to share all those uh, shared variables. And uh, so uh, for the next part, I'm going to talk about how do we optimize this uh, IPG reprogramming overheads. We optimize that on the global IPG allocation level. So the key idea is just to, we want to, re, uh, we want to avoid IPGA reprogramming as much as possible. Uh, so I'll just show an example. Here uh, is a bad allocation. So when we have four applications using a requesting two types of accelerators, if the applications requesting different types of accelerators got allocated on the same node, they are going to compete the IPGA resource, and then the IPGA resource, the IPGA chip, need to be reprogrammed to serving uh, two different kinds of accelerators, logical accelerators. So then uh, a better allocation is simply localize the application requesting one type of accelerator on, on, on different nodes. And uh, the, the important part is that because the workload is changing dynamically, the global accelerator manager needs to make such decision uh, dynamically or with, with some uh, information on the application. So, so next, I'm going to briefly uh, talk about the evaluation of Blaze. First, I show a very uh, a naive programming effort reduction uh, illustration. Here, um, we show the lines of code reduction of the accelerator management. So this part does not include the, the changes in the application or the necessary code you need to uh, control the accelerators because usually those part is uh, a one-time deal. You only need to program your accelerator once and then let people use it. But this part is really more difficult because in the current accelerator programming model, you need to have both uh, all the informations with application accelerator programming as well as some system administration. So then, uh, although the code might, might not seem to be a lot, uh, it is very difficult for uh, big data programmers to do this. Uh, the, but the blaze, uh, what we do is we want to uh, reduce that, and we, use, we want to eliminate that and provide a general runtime. And uh, these workloads are what we have at UCLA, as well as uh, Falcon Computing. This is general compute intensive workloads. And uh, at both uh, UCLA CDSC and uh, Falcon, we have uh, the small scale clusters that is equipped with uh, both low power GPUs and FPGAs so that uh, these accelerators is uh, the form factor let them to fit in the commodity servers and we have a bunch of them then uh, we can do uh, evaluations on different workloads including uh, genomic sequencing and uh, machine learning. So here is a very uh, a simple uh, results on the overall system performance and energy efficiency achieved. In general, we achieved 1.7x speed up to 3.2x speed up and 1.5 to 2.8x energy reduction. So finally, uh, let me show a quick demo. Uh, so these are, uh, this will be a demo uh, executed on uh, Amazon EC2. Uh, we requested uh, four instance and uh, two instances with CPU and two instances with uh, GPU. So this is a, a short video we recorded a couple of days ago to uh, make it uh, smoother. <laughs> so uh, here we show a, a normal uh, Hadoop yarn cluster management GUI. And then, sorry, just pause real quick. And then uh, in this uh, uh, node statistic, we show that there are four nodes and then the two nodes that had GPU, we assigned a label on them. This is a NVIDIA GPU with OpenCL, uh, with OpenCL runtime. 
And then uh, just to uh, mention a little bit, these two nodes are, uh, one of them has one GPU and the other has four GPU. So the, one of them is a 2x GPU instance and the other one is an 8x instance. We're gonna show with the uh, runtime system, the, acceler uh, the application does not need to be aware of such heterogeneous configuration of the nodes. So, uh, we, uh, so these node, level, uh, no, node labels are propagated by the node manager running on these two GPU nodes. And we added another accelerator page showing all the ex available uh, logical accelerators in the data center on our cluster as well as their devices. So we have logistic gradient and k-means contribute uh, calculation on the GPU. So now uh, we're going to into the terminal and we're gonna start launching some Spark job to the cluster. So first, uh, I, uh, I will show uh, a Spark uh, summit uh, uh, script for the CPU. So this will be a normal Spark summit script. This is uh, traditional with, with uh, nothing changed with some binary uh, logistic uh, JR. And then we launch it to the Yarn um, cluster. And we can see in the GUI uh, the, uh, the, the, uh, the management, uh, the resource manager received the request and then the request will be accepted and then um, launched on two of the CPU nodes. So in this node uh, page, we can see that uh, the containers as well as the application master are launched on the CPU nodes. And then when the uh, computation finish, we can see this is a small data set. The computation finishes in about one and a half minutes. So now let's look at the script to launch it, the same application, the same JR file, but with accelerators. So in the script, the only thing changes is this line to assign a label to the Spark Summit uh, script. We assign this logistic gradient label to it so that we, this job needs a logistic gradient calculation accelerator. And then when we launch this uh, new script, uh, we also start a script to monitor the GPU utilization using this uh, NVIDIA uh, driver call. And then uh, you can see this uh, new accelerator uh, equipped uh, logistic uh, application is accepted. And then the uh, container, the uh, executors, bar executors are launched on the nodes with GPU accelerators. And uh, when the job finishes, you can see it finishes in a little more than 30 seconds. So that's the uh, 3x speed up we talked about. And uh, now let's look at uh, the GPU utilization plot. We, ha we have a very simple Python script to plot that. Uh, so first, let's look at the GPU utilization on the first node where there's only one GPU. So yeah, on the top, we show that uh, during the execution of the job, the uh, GPU utilization is about 75%. And then we plot the uh, utilization for the four GPU nodes. And because uh, this is a very small uh, workload and then the task number is limited, so then the utilization on the four uh, GPUs are a little bit lower because there are not enough workloads there. So for the next part, uh, we're going to show that we're able to share the same accelerators with multiple jobs such that we can increase the utilization as well as the system performance. So here we're just going to launch three uh, uh, logistic jobs simultaneously. And uh, from the GUI, um, you can see that both, all the three jobs are uh, accepted by the Yarn manager uh, instantly. Uh, right. And then uh, we can also see that in the node page, uh, all the containers, uh, executor containers are launched on the uh, GPU nodes. And when the job finishes, you can see all the three jobs is actually finishes a little bit more than 30 seconds because uh, for each job, they have some time to load the data as well as, so then the accelerated execution can be overlapped with, a lot, uh, with most part of the CPU execution. And then this uh, GPU utilization on the single node is uh, increased to close to 100%. And then this four GPU nodes, uh, four node GPU uh, nodes also has a great boost on the utilization. 
And with that, I conclude the demo. And then let's go back to final remarks. So the takeaway message is that with, uh, with careful design runtime system, the accelerator deployment can be made easy. And there are a lot of works on the GPU runtime, uh, but uh, our experience show that IPDAs require special considerations. And then the key to the efficiency of such system is the JVM to ACC overheads, to accelerator overheads. Uh, we're looking for new ideas. And also, finally, Blaze is an open source project, and uh, we're looking for collaborations. So uh, let me do a little bit advertisement for Falcon Computing. So the uh, main product of Falcon Computing is surrounded around Blaze in order to provide a better experience for deploying accelerators on data center. So uh, we, the Falcon has accel uh, existing accelerator library for deep learning and machine learning, as well as genomic sequencing. And also Falcon has a IPGA, highly optimized IPGA compiler that can transform a software code into, directly into the IPGA uh, implementation. And then these two parts can be uh, synthesized into Blaze-ready, Blaze-compatible accelerators. And on the runtime, we also have better, uh, uh, better management and the platform support. So finally, we thank our sponsors uh, for support and machine donations. And with that, I conclude the talk, and we're welcome for questions. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, group presentation. Uh, so from the demo, it seemed like Blaze runs on top of um, OpenCL um, uh, for the GPU, at least. Uh, is that the case also for the FPGA implementation? Yes. Um, if not, what changes do you make to support FPGAs? Right, so uh, for uh, actually Blaze is uh, compatible with uh, uh, different kinds of runtimes in this case because we provide a C++ accelerator interface. So whether you use OpenCL or use CUDA, it can be both supported. And uh, but yeah, to answer your question, we have both OpenCL, uh, we have the OpenCL runtime for both GPU and FPGA. And because OpenCL, although OpenCL has a, a specification for heterogeneous platform, the vendor implementation of the runtime is slightly different from one another. So for that, we do need to provide different implementations of that. In Blaze, we have this abstraction called platform. So each platform, you can have a platform for OpenCL, platform for OpenCL IPGA, platform for OpenCL GPU. And then those platform implementations, similar to OpenCL, can be loaded at runtime uh, from Blaze as a dynamic library. Yeah. Um, for your physical accelerators, uh, what compile times are you seeing for the FPGAs, and how often do you recompile? Right, for the, so this is a, a, a big problem of IPGA, uh, because IPGA compilation typically takes uh, hours, usually they need to be done overnight. So uh, that, that's the main reason we provide accelerator as a service rather than the, for the GPU case, so the, a lot of the runtime support is just in time compilation. So for the IPGA is that uh, you have this accelerator is semi-fixed. You program the accelerator once and the accelerator can be switched at runtime, but then you don't really resynthesize because every time you resynthesize, it takes a long time. So if your workload gradually, you need to do it offline. Uh, hi, two questions. Uh, first one is, uh, what was the roughly the amount of uh, data that was being sent to the accelerator in this experiment? And uh, the second question is, uh, is there a point at which if the data grows so big that your either your serialization, deserialization, or the uh, JVM to ACC um, communication, that overhead becomes so much that it's not uh, uh, you might as well uh, compute everything on CPU. Right, thank you. Uh, that's a great question. So for the, for the first one, you, you're asking for the demo, is that right? So we're, we're just running a very small data set. This is a MNIST uh, candidate recognition. So 60,000 uh, 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 data samples, each with like a 70, 700 uh, floating points. So a couple hundred megabytes. Uh, and the second question, uh, part of that is really related to the application. For example, if your application is very compute intensive, uh, we see that, uh, for example, deep learning, the computation times is uh, much larger than the data transfer time. For that, uh, if you're accelerating the deep learning, uh, the convolutional neural network on, on the GPU, the, the benefit of getting it accelerated uh, outweighs the, uh, the data transfer. But for a lot of workload, 
like this logistic regression and k-means, this is like a, a in-between kind of a, a scenario. So in some cases, if the data is very, very large, uh, such that it cannot fit in the memory or the accelerator de uh, uh, device memory, then we see a, a pretty big overhead in the data transfer. Yeah, so then I think the, the question is really uh, what kind of accelerators uh, you provide. So for those that the computation, non-computation intensive, those are better uh, integrated, uh, better executed on the CPU. Yeah. Uh, question here. Uh, where? <laughs> Oh, okay. So, uh, why is 2x speed up uh, good enough to, to move to accelerators rather than scaling up the number of computing nodes? Um, are, are you asking the trade off between uh, yes. CPU and accelerators? Um, so, I, I think uh, part, of the, uh, part of the motivation for, for, for this part, for, for our research, is that the scaling of the CPU is coming to an end. So then when it's coming to an end, and then the, de the demand for uh, data center keep growing, there's a limit on the amount of computation you can provide in the data center, typically limited by the energy. So then there's really this, uh, we need to seek of a new uh, techniques such as, uh, like the customized accelerators to uh, sustain this uh, scaling. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Right, so the question is that uh, what's the effort of doing this platform support on different types of accelerator platform? So like I said uh, in the earlier uh, uh, comments is that the Blaze, as, uh, aside from this accelerator implementation API, also has a platform API. So all you need to do to support, for example, uh, like the Intel uh, AAL runtime to support the Intel HARP in socket system, uh, you, you only need to wrap the AAL APIs uh, with APIs of the Blaze platform. And then you want to, in the platform, we define some physical queues and then the scheduling for that. Similarly for IBM CAPI. So uh, I think uh, if, if not now, or maybe in the near future, IBM CAPI is going to support OpenCL, right? So then I think the similar techniques in the OpenCL runtime for IP, other, IP, other type of IPGA can be leveraged. So there's a really little overhead in supporting different platforms. Okay, right, with that, thank you very much, and then, uh, yeah.